Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You have reached the No Name Cinema Society, a film review show that does a deep dive on these movies, discussing films just a little bit deeper than a lot of shows online. It is Monday, August 6th, and it's time for our Indie Spotlight episode. Throughout 2018, we're looking back at indies from five years ago, and tonight we have an Oscar-nominated documentary from that year, 2013. We're reviewing The Square, ladies and gentlemen. And hi, my name is Jonathan Betzler. I'm one of your hosts here this evening, and I'm back here in Los Angeles. Uh, I'm here with Emma. She's here to celebrate with us, and I'll tell you what she's celebrating uh, in just a moment as I break open this sangria here, um, which is very exciting. Um, mixing up, usually have beer. Uh, I'm going to do something a little bit different. It's a sangria in a bottle. Uh, so I don't want to drink too much because I'll get totally wasted during the show. But um, so that's what I'm drinking. Hope you guys are drinking out there too. And I'm drinking something, ooh, fruity. Um, I'm drinking something special because it is, we are in the middle of our 50th set of episodes, the big 5-0. We never thought we'd get here. It's very exciting. And celebrating with me and Emma is uh, our, my co-host, starting with a tyrannical ruler that we need to overthrow. Ladies and gentlemen, Drunk Davey is with us. Yeah, how you doing? Good. How are how are you? You're uh, back in New York. Yeah, yeah, loving it. I'm loving it. Davy, the big five zero. This is our fiftieth indie. Isn't it crazy? How time flies. Feels like just uh, seventy five episodes ago, we uh, we got started. <laughs> and our other host, ladies and gentlemen, is a charming revolutionary, angry at pretty much every leader that he comes across. Alex Evans is back. Viva la revolution. <laughs> however that translates into arabic <laughs> <laughs> and he said it with such passion didn't he ladies and gentlemen it was so uh, it was just so convincing uh here is our schedule for this our big 50th set of episodes the big 5-0 it started this past thursday august 2nd with the review of mission impossible fallout tonight of course is august 6th we're doing the square on this Thursday, August 9th, Davey, myself, and a new member will be discussing Pride of the Yankees. And Alex will be back a week from tonight on August 13th for our 34th sound off, which, which I'm going to introduce a new segment. Alex is going to do a second run, and I'm supposed to count down my top five sports biopics, and that's coming up a week from tonight. That's the schedule. Every 10 episodes, we sort of have a look back at... Uh, the last 10 set of 10 episodes that we've done. So here is the last 10 indies that we've done. This is Alex's first indie, I think, but Davey's been a part of almost all of these. Quite a list, starting with Sound of My Voice. Episode 41 it was like over a year ago. It's taken a while to get this last 10. We got busy. I guess that's a good thing, right? Absolutely. It's a good thing for our lives. Maybe not for the <laughs> momentum of the show, but anything on this list stand out to you? Yeah, there's a lot of bad movies on here. I like every movie on this list pretty much, but it's interesting that Davey... You're friends with us, so how do we trust your taste? <laughs> good point. Good point. Friend. Blue is the warmest color is okay. Sleep on with me is good. We yeah. went through a streak where Davey liked almost all the indies. We are on a down streak with Davey. You liked How to Survive a Plague? Is number 45. How to Survive a Plague is great. Alex, have you seen any of these indies on this list here? I have not. Oh, he's 0 for 10. Well, I saw The Square. Well, obviously. Okay, and we're about to talk about that. So that, that's been our last 10 indies. I recommend them each. Davey recommends How to Survive a Plague. The one that stands out to me, I think, Deep Blue Sea, Spectacular Now, Rust and Bone are all, to me, really, really strong films that are worth revisiting. So tonight, the trivia for the, that was for tonight's episode was uh, another foreign film, this time a documentary, because our last indie was a French film called Blue is the Warmest Color. Now we've got an Egyptian film. And this one takes on recent history as it goes behind the scenes of an event that started only two years prior. And that is, of course, in 2011, the citizens of Egypt gathered in Tahrir Square and started a revolution. And by 2013, the documentary was already out in theaters. Uh, the documentary takes us up to about February 2013. So that's how recent, how, that's how quick the turnaround was. The film was nominated for the Oscar for Best Documentary, losing to the film 20 Feet from Stardom, which might come up later this year on the Indie Spotlight if we get there. It is the fourth documentary we've ever done on the show. Let's see if Davey can remember the three other ones. Documentary, right. Uh, we did uh, We did the, the Interrupters, um, the music one. What's his face? Something about the thousand years. And like <laughs> It's called 10,000 Days on Earth. Oh, 10,000 Days on Earth. What was it? Nick Cave. Nick Cage, yeah. Nick Cave. Right. 
the last documentary was How to Survive a Plague. How to Survive a Plague. There you go. He oh, got right. the three of them. Okay. So this is all four. right. This is number four. And here is the summary, ladies and gentlemen. In February 2011, the people of Egypt took to the streets to protest the oppressive rule of the Mubarak regime. Somehow their voices were heard and Mubarak steps down, leaving the military in charge of the country. The people gathered in Tahrir Square to celebrate at the potential of a new tomorrow, only to find that military rule was even more tyrannical than the previous regime, starting a cycle of violence and protest that has come to define modern e Egypt. Guys, how was that summary? Pretty Nailed it. This is Alex's first indie, so maybe he doesn't know the structure. Whoever recommends the film goes first, and it is my recommendation. And I have lots of complex feelings about this one. Um, it has a lot in common with our last documentary, How to Survive a Plague, in the sense that it, uh, it features an army of cameras leading to astronomical access to being inside the movement. It did a good job of establishing a series of characters for us to follow and be engaged by. It's a testament simultaneously to the power of protest and perhaps ultimately and unintentionally to the futility of it. At the same time, I have struggles with the film. It does feel wholly one-sided, even if it's seemingly the right side. Ultimately, it's as much of a propaganda piece as any of our films from 1942. I also have some issues with some of its structural choices. We'll get to that. Overall, it's a net positive, definitely a powerful experience. Has anybody heard of this film before? Yes, I had. I had too. Davey, have you seen it before? I hadn't seen it. No, it was actually showing not too long ago, and I and I meant to go see it, and I just couldn't get to it. So now you watched it uh, for for this, and it's time for opening thoughts. And uh, per tradition, I'm gonna let Davey go first and show people how it's done. No, I thought it was a great documentary, and maybe I thought it was a little more even-handed than than you. Okay, interesting. We'll have to open up that uh, can of worms, Alex. I really enjoyed the film. I would argue that since 1953, uh, we the world has gotten an extremely one-sided view of Egypt, and giving two hours to people outside of that view does not feel one-sided to me. But first, let's talk about what I think were the positive things, and uh, and and a lot of things about the structure are positive. Um, the access, being inside the revolution, horrific images at times that catch their various leaders. They go through three or four leaders over the course of the film, uh, leaders of the country. Uh, and it, it catches, the, their footage catches the leaders in flat out lies, uh, which is very powerful stuff. Guys, what did you think about the access that the film was giving us? I was kind of blown away by it. I'd never gotten a feel for the rank and file of the Muslim Brotherhood. I had known that the leadership is pretty terrible, but the access was pretty amazing. Alex, what about you? Did you feel like you were seeing everything you needed to see? I was really impressed with the diversity of characters they were able to establish and show the different points of view and that there was more commonality that I would say that even Al Jazeera or CNN or the BBC gives us when we hear news about Egypt. These are real people that all live in the same neighborhoods. It was thorough in that regard, and that was very telling, and I like that. And, and that is a segue to my next thing, it is the characters. There's lots of charismatic, interesting people to follow. Um, I would argue that we weren't introduced to them in as organic a way as how to survive in, in, in a plague. Like that, that the, our, them in introducing those characters felt a lot more fluid. Here there was like titles and vocal descriptions that felt a little forced, like, the, you know, sh shoving these characters in our faces. I liked how, how widespread the, the characters were that we were meeting, like the different points of view. Like, uh, Dave already talked about the Muslim Brotherhood. Like I, I liked you know, how they sort of covered a gamut. I did think that they were sort of forced into us in the editing of How to Survive a Plague. It was a little more even and fluid. Davey, you saw that other film. Am I making any sense? No, I think you are making sense. I hadn't really thought about it, but yeah. And I mentioned it to say documentaries, it's hard to criticize the content. We talk about story all the time when we're criticizing narrative stuff because it's fiction and it's being created. When we're talking about documentary reviews, it's the main criticism is about form. So the things I'm looking for are the choices they're making to tell the story, because obviously the content is already very rich. Alex, are you annoyed with my statement? I think I've probably worked on the most documentaries out of the three of us. And oh, damn, did he just pull rank on us? I will, a little bit. Marty. <laughs> Just, just, um, it's a lot of you just assemble this like humongous pile of footage, and then you have to figure out who do I, I have to tell a story yeah. on to establish a character and tell a story. I know, like, the one um, younger female filmmaker character, I don't feel like she gets fleshed out that much in the film, but mm -hmm. 
I have a feeling a lot of the footage we're watching, she's the one shooting it. The thing that struck me, because I was comparing this to How to Survive a Play, How to Survive a Play, what made that so amazing is that it was compiling footage that was not taken to be in a documentary. Whereas this probably presents a whole a whole lot of different challenges where you're actually acquiring the footage to be part of a documentary. And also How to Survive the Plague had the advantage of 20 years of afterthought, you know, and, and, and perspective Absolutely. on the subject where this was rushed into theaters, which leads to what, you know, what I'm gonna say later about the one-sided nature of it. Um, so the next, the next thing I wanted to talk about was the editing. Uh, you know, similarly about these characters, the beginning exposition was a, a little clunky. It, uh, it, it might as well have been title cards setting us up instead of like the, the narrative voiceover. At least the title cards would have been a little more straightforward. Um, one thing I did like about the editing, I did like cutting in the US and British news reports. Um, I like that because it sort of showed, the it contrasted what we were seeing versus the what the global perspective was and I think that was a very helpful frame of reference. Um, and I, I, I have something about the interviews too, but, I, but before I get to that, um, my, uh, the exposition and the news reports, anything on either of those things? I agree with you that they were a really valuable tool for creating that contrast between, because it's also, if you think in terms of posterity, if someone's watching this documentary in 20 years from now and aren't familiar with the event, um, they might not realize, hey, the story I'm getting from these activists on the ground is different than what the people in the rest of the world were hearing. And it allows that context. Well, it'll be interesting to see what the documentary looks like 20 years from now. I'd like to see those people again and see how their perspective had shifted over that time. And we should have done this, we should have done that kind of thing. I think Alex is being generous. People in the United States don't follow the wars that we're in ourselves, let alone what's going on in Egypt. You know, I think they needed to set the film up for a giant portion of the audience that is completely unfamiliar with the material. Well, for what it's worth, I agree that it was necessary. What I don't agree with is the way it was handled. The voiceover and the character explaining it felt a little clunky to me. I almost wish they'd had just like a scroll or a title card just setting us up for that. That would have been just a little more direct. This felt like asking one of our characters to like explain it to us. Um, and and uh, it's the show don't tell kind of mentality, I guess. Alex, do you have anything on the editing? I was really impressed with it for how big amount of the footage I imagine they had. And cause it was definitely clearly a lot of mixed media and different sources and things that were, it wasn't like a consistent crew and one camera just like staked out following the whole thing. That That is true. That 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 is true. The, the, the and I, I didn't have that in my notes uh, and that is something to be, that's the job they took on on, on one end, but it, it, it certainly was a mammoth undertaking in that regard. I do yeah, have- the, I imagine the assistant editor work was really, really good because that's who's like assembling like, okay, we like Ahmed. So then they go through and try to find every single clip of Ahmed. Once again, Alex trying to throw some love to the below the liners. I did feel like Ahmed's private interviews seemed to be used as band-aids for narrative gaps. Like anytime they felt like, or they were having trouble linking the thread together, they would come to Ahmed. And sometimes it almost felt like the interviews were after the fact or sort of out of time. His haircut was different. For sure that was done. That was pretty obvious, but I think it's tremendous that they got the trust of a subject to be willing to do that for them. As a subject, he's also one of the filmmakers, ultimately. I get the impression that him, the guy that was in The Kite Runner, um, and the female one that you were referring if, to earlier. So do, you, do you have a criticism that you believe documentary by its nature should be objective? To me, the best documentaries are the most powerful documentaries. Just show something as it is. I was just having this conversation earlier today at a, at a shot listing meeting um, that show things as it is and lets the audience decide for themselves. Um, and th so yes, I do feel like there is, there, I would like an objectivity and I grant you, they did try to talk to those military people, and I appreciated that, but I, but I have a, a, some thoughts on that. And what I was going to say about the Ahmed thing is, I agree, it showed some storytelling sense that they knew they needed to fill these gaps, but, but it also, as a storyteller myself and a filmmaker, it was very clear to me that's what it was. And it I, did take away some of your in this moment now kind of thing. I see what you're saying. As someone that's done a lot of documentary films, I've noticed this is something for people that come from a narrative background or ge just general audience, this idea that documentary is just a fly in the wall where you don't control things and it's this very like sterile academic pursuit. 
I don't think that necessarily. I just like to see my side thoroughly explore. All right. We've heard the autocratic rulers of Egypt for 5,000 years. I'm good on their point of view. The point is, as a piece of work, that's going to stand the test of time, I do feel like it needed to stand independently of that. It cannot rely on assumptions that you've heard everything the autocratic Egyptian rulers have. The only thing I'll say to this is... No, no, no. I am likely to be sympathetic with them. I mean, like, this was not necessarily a film made, you know, to be uh, that, to be that objective documentary. This was a film made as propaganda. This was a film made as a cry for help. To, so that the world knew what was going on. But it only showed that perspective of things. And those interviews with the military were not, there wasn't very much of them. And I got the impression that it was edited in such a way to show the very worst of the situation. They had the power with their editing tool to manipulate that. And it felt that manipulated to me. I applaud the effort to talk to the military, but it still didn't feel balanced to me. My retort to that in the filmmaker's defense is if you're on the ground filming these activists and the military and terrorist factions are firing guns at you, firing rubber bullets and beanbag guns at you and throwing tear gas at you when you got a camera in your hand and press on your jacket or your hat, it doesn't matter that you're pressed. They're firing at you and your life's on the line. That makes it a little hard to be like, I should really go get their point of view. I understand that, but I, I can ha still have an issue with the documentary for, you know what I mean? Like, I understand all the reasons for it. That doesn't make it a better documentary. I mean, mm -hmm. that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the two hours and change, or maybe it's a little less than that, uh, of this film and how it translates as a work of documentary film. You could say on a narrative, oh, we ran out of time and we weren't able to get, there's tons of different reasons and excuses for everything, but now it's a finished piece of art. And so I have the right to question some of the form. The reasons are unimportant. Ultimately, I don't mean to sound cold and callous. This is a film review show and that's what we're looking at here. And Davey's usually the cold and callous one, so. Nice. It shows, the, I think, the military uh, in, the, in the best light that is, I think, ethically, truthfully possible in the sense that they started off as a constructive player. They took over for Mubarak and they at least ushered in elections, although they probably rushed them so that I don't think that the military rushed the elections to get the Muslim Brotherhood to, to, to take over and to win. So I think that they were at least um, shown to be um, shown to be at least a, a fair player early on. But it's funny because I felt those interviews that they had with, they had two interviews, like the publicist and also like they did have a rank and file military member that sort of laughed off the whole Tahrir Square thing. Um, and both of those interviews felt like cartoonish. And I got the sense that we weren't seeing every, they, was, they were just showing us the most insensitive things that they could possibly say. I, that was- I think the sense. interviews with the, I think the interviews with the officials are totally fair game. I think you could make the argument that, that the driver is they you know you you can find um, a low level person that's a jerk and 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 make hay out of that. They certainly they committed atrocities and and to not document that would 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 have been a sin. I'm but certainly they, not criticizing no, no, the film. They did it about as fair a job as I think anybody really could do. Fair a job as they within the middle of it can do, and it's good to have their perspective. An outsider coming into that would have possibly been able to do a more fair job in that regard. Again, this is my recommendation, so I like the film. Yeah, I, 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 I play devil's advocate, I guess, sure. just naturally. It was a film made, I think, as a piece of propaganda, and I, I, the phrase I used earlier is a cry for help, almost. I just want to clarify that I think it's a very strong and important film. We're digging deeper, and I, there's a couple things that I just would have liked to have seen done differently, if possible. Um, so. Uh, I want to move on to the T word here because our time is running out. But the T word, of course, is themes, which Davy hates talking about. And one of the themes I brought up early on is this concept of the power and the futility of protests. And I want to make my point about this. You get the sense of the power of the protests because they made global headlines, A, the, the protesters, the revolutionaries in, in uh, Tahrir Square. And ultimately, they overthrew three regimes, or so it seems. Five years later, um, they are still oppressed. They are still under, in 2018, they are still under military rule. All they seem to succeed in doing is giving an excuse for the next dictator to seize power under the guise of helping 
the people. Now we're not talking about the form as much. Now we're talking about one of the things that I'm taking thematically from the documentary. And I'm curious what you guys have to say about that. Davey, you hate the T word. So what do you think about this concept of the power and the futility of the protesting? It made the film hard to watch because you don't get to experience any of that hope if you know how things turn out. It's a hard watch in that sense. They're just as oppressed. Nothing much has changed. Looking back at this and re-interviewing some of those guys 20 years down the line, like, what would they say? What could they say? Like, I'd be, that's, I'd be fascinated to see that. I think that it's definitely worth a sequel if they want to come back and shoot the next how things are now. I think that would be dynamite. Well, I mean, I, I would like the story to come to a more more of a resolution before they, they revisit yeah, I mean, it. <laughs> I'm sure they would, too. But yeah, 5,000 years. Who knows? A lot of it seemed like all these characters were tied between like everyday pragmatism and I idealism. Um, you know, especially that guy who's in the Muslim Brotherhood and has a family, and it's just like the Muslim Brotherhood's getting mad at him for like being friends with other people and having to worry about his family, and he's like, you know, getting my kids to school and feeding them. Like that has to come before me marching in the street. That's a good segue, Alex. Into the next thing I want to talk about. The other fascinating thing to me and. The the thing I think that hurts their revolution in general is the division within the revolution. I mean, their noble cause was ultimately thwarted by the very religious portion of their group taking advantage of the open government. People amongst the revolutionaries were pigeonholed into groups, whether it's practicing Muslims, more secular Muslims, Christians, and the military, each group ultimately hating the other without really knowing each other. We get to know one Muslim who uh, you were just referring to, who's mostly one of our heroes, but then is yelled at randomly at a, by a passerby who decides he's the enemy because of his religion and some of the behavior of others that are a part of his religion and his religious group. That was a fascinating portrait of Egypt. And I think that division suggests how they are so easily, unfortunately, oppressed. You know, it's interesting to me, all the dividing lines between people that have different opinions on secularism versus re like religious stuff when both like the Arab ethnic group and the Islamic religion are from a violent, oppressive, authoritarian invasion. It's hard for people within those religions to reconcile that. It shows that, you know, that's something that needs to be taken into account into, I, I would say, a pluralistic par parliamentary system that in the most idealistic uh, interpretation of the Iranian constitution, they have uh, political parties largely are organized along religious lines depend, uh, that get so many seats depending on like the census data. Well, I almost wish that weren't the case because I feel like the, the, the biggest danger that I take from making the film, and maybe I'm just putting, imposing my own uh, political views on it, but I feel like the danger of mixing religion and politics may be the single greatest blight on our planet and has been for centuries as far as I'm concerned, regardless of what part of the world we, you come from. I think it's true in just as much in our country as it is in theirs, but more so in theirs because it, it does feel like religion defines them and, and their divisions a great deal more than it does for here. If it doesn't here, it, we're a little more subtle about it somehow. Um, yeah, but I mean, if, you, if we take religion out of the equation, what's left in Egypt? Isn't there hope for getting along if we stop worrying about the religious differences? I don't know, it's so hard to get people not to think about religion and it's okay to have faith in something, but to let it dictate. It's violence. easier to have that perspective in a postmodern middle-class viewpoint. If you are in a developing nation where you don't have a lot beyond your family, like you may or may not have a steady work, but like your family and your faith are the two things that you have that you can hang on to and that people can't take away from you. And it's worth killing over. I think it can feel that way when that's the last thing you have left to lose. I can understand how a person would feel that way. But, but, but I don't I'll... agree and I would like, I think the bigger thing is creating economic opportunity and equality within their country. Education, like, don't you think a certain amount of like education can help? Because I mean, like, I grew up practicing, you know, Catholic, and and I mean, I still go to church occasionally, but you don't see me, you know, at, at uh, you know, ha hang handling at abortion clinics protesting or anything. I, I mean, it's it's. I think good public schools where people of different backgrounds have to interact with each other is like a really vital thing. And we see throughout the world where that happens, it does create more understanding of the society. Which is why I'm going to drop another documentary name on you. It's called The Promise. It follows around kids from the Palestinian area, the West Bank of Israel, and some Israeli kids. It follows them around and then it forces them 
to have a meeting towards the end of the documentary. It amazingly shows that the hatred is so taught, T-A-U-G-H-T, is something that is handed down from generation to generation. That if Absolutely. You- Take that away. Think about all the lives that can be saved. We've been on a soapbox, Davey, and you've been quiet. I'm trying to look up the documentary, The Promise. Real quick, one of the things I was going to say is the big need that I got out of watching this film was there needs to be a UN coalition force that is able to come in and conduct elections. Not. I some- thought about that, but I mean, like that's that raises a bigger question that that came up today, also in the shot list meeting. Is obviously we got tan- we had tangents in our shot listing meeting. But uh, is is that a job of an outside force? Like, uh, you know, is the UN's job to be the policeman of the world? Is it is it fully the, their responsibility to interfere with ultimately the religion and and uh, politics and culture? Of I don't different- think they need to interfere with the religion or culture, but I think making I mean, sure that an election isn't rigged and isn't run by intimidation. But don't you see how they go hand in hand? At least that's one of the things I took from this documentary: religion, culture, and Egyptian identity, they seem to go hand in hand, and that's part of the issue. If I'm an Egyptian, I f- start to feel like the UN's the enemy in that scenario, or, or I maybe I want the UN, maybe I don't. Like, I don't know. I, I, I see your point, and I thought about I mean, that, but I worry about it. If you support the government, then sure, you're against the UN, but the fact that you can't go to a poll and vote for who you want without your life being threatened. Yeah, because the thought of an election being 97%. In one guy's favor, sounded awfully fishy to me. I forget the guy's the guy's name who's uh, the the Muslim Brotherhood guy, Magdi. He seems like a pretty reasonable guy and not an extremist by any stretch, and also a tolerant guy. But I, I wish I could have fleshed out his vision of how a Islamist leadership would work. I agree with that. I got the impression, and maybe it was the film's fault, or maybe it was just his fault. He seemed to be playing both sides against the Middle Yeah, East. this idea that like everybody who joins the Muslim Brotherhood is this extremist wanting to cut everybody's head off, like Man. they're not. What kind of rights would he grant non-Muslims? What kind of participation would that kind of leadership allow them uh, in government? That's the issue with the protests in general, um, and, and uh, and this will be the last point I think we have, we'll have time for, uh, is it almost felt like the 99 percenters, if you remember that movement, yeah. in the sense that it was so unfocused. We want change. We don't necessarily know what that change is, but we want change. And there was never, at least was in the film, point. specified exactly. They wanted a regime down. They did not necessarily suggest the alternatives. That is the most dangerous thing of all because that paved the way for the next dictator to come along. They wanted a constitutional government. It was very nonspecific, at least within the film, and maybe the film made a choice not to get into the specifics, but I felt like I could have used that information. For sure. I mean, that lack of knowing exactly what everybody wanted and being like unified in it or having a unifying figure for people to get behind. Um, I think of France in their revolution in the 1780s and 90s and how that led to Napoleon becoming a dictator. Yes. Um, it's 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 almost I mean like the whole point of learning history. I'm about to get frustrated again. The whole point of learning history is to avoid it, you know, like avoid repeating the travesties of history. Like why does this keep happening? Like what is wrong with people? Without education, like you were saying, none of these people have the opportunity to go to graduate school and become a constitutional scholar. And that brings uh, and, back and, to economics. Yeah, maybe if Ahmed had the chance to go to grad school and everything, he could have like a great proposal and be a qualified leader. Or he, he doesn't have those opportunities, just, so he's just an angry kid. Maybe in the it's not about grad school. Like maybe it's just high school. Like who knows? And, and by the way, that documentary that I referred to earlier that I called The Promise, it's called Promises well, 2001. So I was close. All right, guys, it's a fascinating conversation. Um, unfortunately, we've got to wrap things up. Um, uh, do, do, do you have any quick closing thoughts, uh, Alex? I'm thankful that these people were able to survive the effort to document this event and share their experiences with us. Davey? I thought it was a great movie, and I uh, definitely gave me a perspective that um, you know I, I, I hadn't seen in film before. So, Do you want to thank me for recommending it? No, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> <laughs> I set myself up. All right, guys, we continue our examination of indies from 2013 in about a month or so. Uh, maybe a little less than that. Maybe uh, we can get into it by late August. Uh, and our, your trivia for the next indie is a movie that gets its title from movie trailers. So we'll look into that, and maybe you know the answer to that one. Uh, next up, though, is just is going to be our classic 
movie discussion that's just coming up in a couple days. It's Thursday, August 9th. We're going to talk about Pride of the Yankees, one of our 1942 films that I'm going to finally make Davey watch. Talked about a lot in our 1942 interview. We're going to examine it even deeper on our next class movie discussion. In the meantime, I can say to you, this meeting of the No Name Cinema Society is adjourned.